So for the rest of us here, let's open up to Acts chapter 1, and let's read our verses here. Okay? Acts chapter 1, look at verses 1 through 11. In verse 1, it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, And while standing with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood with, by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking to heaven? This Jesus who has taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Imagine that you're getting on an airplane and you're flying to the east coast. And also imagine now that the pilot decides to change the heading of that plane by just three and a half degrees, which is about seven feet from the nose of the plane, you know, just shifting the nose about seven feet. Now, it doesn't sound like it's much of a change, but it is. It's the difference between your flight landing in New York City or landing in Washington, D.C. That's a 225-mile difference. This seemingly small change meant the difference between arriving at your destination or getting completely off track. You know, I share this with you because in many ways, this has happened to the church. You know, in the original language, in the Greek, the word church is translated ekklesia, which literally means gathering or assembly. And when you break down the word itself, the word, the, 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 you have ek, which means out of, and then you have kaleo, which means called out. So together, the word ekklesia is a word that describes the assembly of people who have been called out for mission to bring the good news of Jesus Christ life, death, and resurrection to the whole entire world. This has always been the original destination of the church. But over time, the heading of the church changed. People stopped seeing the church as a people on mission, but a place for religious services, you know, a, a place to go ahead and receive things. You know, our, our English word for church doesn't come from the Greek, but it actually comes from the German word, you know, keka. And, and it means a sacred place to gather for religious purposes. This change in word shows a shift in thinking that rather than the church being a movement of God storming the gates of hell, people start to see the church as a place that you attended. It became an institution. It became an event. It became a holy huddle. This is the danger of the church, of our church in every generation, is that instead of being outward focused, we become incredibly inward focused, and we seek to be a gospel movement. This is why we're starting this new series in the book of Acts, because this book is going to serve as a course correction for the church. Now, the book of Acts records the first 30 years of the life of the church, and in verse 1, it starts off this way. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now, we don't know exactly who Theophilus was, but most scholars believe that he was a wealthy Roman official who helped sponsor the gospel work of Paul and Luke. So Luke is writing to give him an update on what's going on here. You know, in addition, the author Luke says here that in the first book, so he's reminding us here that the book of Acts is a two-part volume, that the first part was the gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts is a continuation of that story. He says in verse 1, I dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. 
Jesus began to do and teach. The gospel of Luke was just the beginning of the story. Think about how crazy that is. In that gospel, you have the miracles, Jesus walking on water, feeding the thousands, the healings, the teachings. Jesus goes to the cross and brings us peace with God. And on the third day, he is raised from the dead victorious, conquering sin, Satan, and death. And Luke is saying that you read all that in the gospel of Luke, that is just the beginning. Jesus is just getting started. Jesus came with the mission to seek and save the lost, and he is not done yet. He is still seeking and saving the lost, and now he calls the church to join in that mission. That is the book of Acts. The question for you as we go through this entire sermon series is this. What kind of church do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a church where you attend and receive spiritual services, or do you want to be a church that is a movement of the gospel changing the world, first starting in the South Loop, in University, University Village, where you guys are at right now? You know, with the time that we have today, I want to lay the groundwork for what it means to be a part of a, a gospel movement, like what we see in the book of Acts. So let me just summarize it in a sentence, and then I'll, I'll break it down for us in the sermon. Let me just summarize it this way. What does it mean to be a part of a gospel movement? Jesus empowers us with the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of his kingship and kingdom. Jesus empowers us with the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of his kingship and kingdom. So first let me just break this down. So first Jesus empowers us with the Holy Spirit for this mission. Look at verse 4 and 5 here. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, telling his disciples, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus is with his disciples on a mountain outside of Jerusalem, and everyone is still in awe that Jesus has died and he has rose again, and everyone is pumped. The gang is back together. They have their leader back. You know, now they can storm the world. But notice what Jesus says to them. He tells them to wait. Don't you dare leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, why does Jesus do this? It's because he knew that the mission was far too big for them. That without the Holy Spirit filling them and empowering them, they would be doomed. They would fall flat on their faces. In verse 8, Jesus lays out his master plan. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, so, this is, so here's the mission. You're going to start sharing the gospel of Jesus where you're at, in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem. Now think about this. What happened in Jerusalem? They killed Jesus. And if they hated him, they're going to hate the disciples. But Jesus continues that after that, I want you to go to, to Judea, right, right outside the city of Jerusalem, and then I want you to go to Samaria. Well, what's problematic about that is that the Jews hated the Samaritans. So this is the master plan of Jesus. I want you to go ahead and share the good news and share it with those first who hate you. And then after they're done hating you, I want you to share it with those that you hate. That, that's what I want you to do. And my goodness, when I think about that, that is so hard because I have a hard enough time sharing the gospel with people that I love and I like, let alone the people I want to avoid or those who hate me. But if that wasn't enough to overwhelm you, then Jesus says, you're not done yet. Then I want you to go to the ends of the earth. I want you to go to places on this planet that you don't even know exist with the good news. Do you see? This is a God-sized mission that could only be accomplished by the power of God. And it's for this reason Jesus goes up into the clouds and leaves them so that he can give them the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised this. He said that as early as John 16, 7. He says, let me show it to you. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him 
to you. Jesus says here that for him to leave is a good thing, but why? It's because Jesus knew that as long as he stayed physically on earth, the mission of God would be constrained. Because Jesus could only be at one place at one time, but it's in the ascension we are given the Holy Spirit that now God's presence isn't just found in one person, Jesus Christ, but God's presence now resides in everyone who believes. This is why Jesus also says in John 14, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to my Father. We, the church, do greater works. Really? Are we greater than Jesus? No way. The reason we do greater works is because the Holy Spirit resides in every genuine believer. And wherever we go, wherever the church goes, so goes the power of God. Jesus fed thousands. The church has fed millions. Jesus proclaimed the good news to the crowd. The church has brought the gospel to the nations. Jesus brought reconciliation between Greeks and Jews. The church is seeking to bring reconciliation to every tribe, nation, and tongue. Jesus tells his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit because they can't do it without him. Now, just jumping a little bit ahead in our verses here, and I hope Pastor Rafe doesn't yell at me here, but jumping a little bit ahead here to next week's passage. After Jesus ascends, the disciples do exactly as they're told. They stay in Jerusalem and they wait. And notice that in their waiting, in verse 14, it says that they're praying. Acts 1.14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Notice that they hear the mission of God, and we don't read about them strategizing or devoting themselves to a business plan. They devoted themselves to prayer. They knew that without God, they would be doomed. In the same way, God has called us to the very same God-sized mission. And for us as a church, we should be desperate for him to show up. But this is the failure of the modern Western church, is that we just don't prioritize prayer, and thus we do not depend on the Holy Spirit. Instead, when it comes to outreach or getting after things in a neighborhood, you know, we trust in how many people do we have? You know, how many staff do we have? You know, how much are our people tithing? You know, how many programs do we have going on? You know, how talented and gifted are the people in the room that we look at these metrics and we think that this will accomplish the mission of God? It will not get the mission done. None of these things matter unless we have the power of God's Spirit. As a matter of fact... We can have the least number of people, the least gifted people, the least amount of resources, but if we have the power of the Spirit, we can reach Chicago and the nations for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Do you believe that God can do that with this church? Do you believe that he can do it in the South Loop? Do you believe that he can do it in Hyde Park? Do you believe that he can do it in the nations? We should believe that. And if so, we should devote ourselves to prayer. The fruitfulness of the early church was not because they were busy, but it was because they yielded themselves to the power of the Spirit in prayer. You know, let me ask you, if God removed the Holy Spirit from your life, would your life look any different? Would your life look any different? I hope so. But if not, if you see no difference, we have to repent of our self-reliance. You know, in the same way, what would happen if God removed the Holy Spirit from our church? Would we look any different? I hope so, because if we're not operating by the Spirit, we might as well close the doors. We are wasting everyone's time here. We cannot do this mission on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. And this leads us to the next point. Why then are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? It's so that we would be his witnesses. Look at verse 8 here. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And here's the purpose. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We are empowered to point people to Jesus. You know, when you think about a courtroom and a witness in a courtroom, they only have one job. It's to tell others what they saw and experienced. To, and in the same way, as a church, all we're to do is to witness Jesus and to say to others, look at him. Look at how he changed my life. Look at how he healed me. Look at how he has given me life and hope and joy. You know, the Swiss theologian Karl Barth wrote volumes and volumes of theological books. And on his desk, he would sit where he did most of his writing. And right above, sitting at his desk, was a picture of a crucified Christ. Let me just show it to you here. Now, what made this picture unique is that also in this picture of a crucified Christ, you have John, and I circled it here, you have John standing there pointing his finger to the crucified Jesus. You know, the reason Karl Barth kept this picture in front of him all the time for all his writings is that he wanted to remind himself that all of his life and all of his teaching was to point to the crucified Jesus. This is what it means to be a witness. Look to Jesus. Look at what he has done. Look at how much he loves you. This is what the sum of our life should be all about. But the challenge for us is that our finger naturally doesn't like to do that. But instead of pointing to Jesus, it always has a way of trying to find a way to point back at ourselves. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. This is why Jesus doesn't just call us to be his witnesses because he could just say, be my witnesses and just go. No, no, no. He knows that without supernatural power transforming us from the inside out, we will always turn inward to self-protection, self-reliance, to self-promotion. Frankly, we don't need the Spirit to come in power if we're just acting like everyone else. We don't need the Spirit if we're being selfish. We don't need the Spirit if we're playing it safe or we're being comfortable. You don't need a supernatural power for that. You don't need the Holy Spirit's power if you plan to stay quiet. But if you plan to be radical and sacrificial, if you're going to talk about Jesus and with others, Jesus promises that you will have the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. And I want to stress here the importance of using our words in our witness Because most often when it comes to being a witness, this is exactly what we don't want to do. Instead, we would rather say, I want to witness with my life. I want to witness by being a good person. I want to witness by putting a smile on my face. And there's nothing wrong with it, and that is necessary. If our words are to have power, it must be in tandem with a credible life. Both go hand in hand, but words are necessary to be a witness because unless we, don't, unless we speak up, salvation will not come. Romans 10, 14 says this, How then will they call on him who have they, who have they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Salvation comes from preaching because it is the heard word of God. And actually what's interesting is that every time when you look at the gospel of Luke and Acts, every time when you see someone filled with the Spirit, they are always proclaiming. Luke chapter 1 verse 15, John the Baptist is filled with the Spirit and proclaims the coming of the Lord. Luke chapter 1 verse 41, Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit and she proclaims a blessing over Mary. In Luke chapter 1 verse 67, Zechariah is filled with the Spirit and prophesies the coming of the glory of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, the Holy Spirit fills the apostles at Pentecost and they began to declare the praises of God in multiple languages. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Peter is filled with the Spirit and preaches to the rulers that Jesus is the only hope of salvation. In Acts chapter 4, verse 31, the disciples are filled with the Spirit and they speak the word of the God boldly in the face of persecution. In Acts chapter 9, verse 20, Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit and immediately begins to preach in the synagogues. You have to see this. To receive the Holy Spirit is to testify about Jesus. Now, some might say, well, I thought the Spirit was given to us to convict us, to comfort us. 
encourage us, guide us, lead us, teach us. And the answer is yes and amen to all of that. But here's the thing. You can't just pick and choose what you want and don't want from the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, the reason the Spirit comforts and counsels and encourages is because He is making you a bold proclaimer. You know, the word witness in the Greek is where we get the word martyr from. You know, church tradition tells us that 10 of the 11 disciples lost their lives for Christ. And the Apostle John was exiled on an island for his faith. Now, why did these men die? Is it because they were being nice and had a smile on their face? No. They died because they proclaimed the gospel. And this is what is happening to believers all around the world. They are being persecuted and they are risking their lives talking about Jesus because people need to hear. And many of our global workers currently are in some of the hardest parts of the world. And if any of you support them, what you know is that when they make the trip to go overseas, the first few years that they spend is actually not busy doing ministry work. They're actually spending the first three to four years of, 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 of overseas missions learning to speak the language. Why? Is it so they can order food or, or know how to get around? No. They spend all those years picking up the language so that they can share Jesus in the native tongue. You know, if I can just sum up the entire book of Acts in a sentence, it would be this. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Here's the rest of the sentence here. Jesus empowers us with the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses of his kingship and kingdom. All right, verse 9 to 11. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men, these are angels, stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, when it says Jesus was lifted up, another way to say it is that Jesus ascended. Now, the word ascended can have a double meaning here. First, it can simply mean just to go up, that he or she ascended the stairs, ascended the ladder. It's just simply just going up and down, right? But the word ascend can also have a symbolic meaning. Like when a prince or princess ascends to the throne, it means someone is taking a place of power, responsibility, and authority. When Jesus ascends into heaven, he's not going up just for the sake of going up, right? He can just do that anytime he wants, but he brings all his disciples around to see this. He gives a very theatrical speech. He gives a blessing. This is a big moment here. He wants everyone to know that I'm not going up as a good man or as a teacher or as a prophet. I am going up as the exalted king, that when Jesus ascends, he is showing physically what is now happening spiritually and cosmically all over creation. Jesus is ruling with kingly power and authority. You know, notice in the opening verses, Jesus rises from the dead, he gathers his disciples, and for the next 40 days, the resurrected Jesus teaches them on the kingdom of God. Look at verse 3. Jesus presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days, during 40 days, and speaking about the kingdom of God. Jesus explains to his disciples that everything that has happened thus far has pointed to the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, when Jesus began his earthly ministry, do you remember what he starts off by saying? He says, the kingdom is at hand. And he demonstrates the breaking in of this kingdom through signs, miracles, and exorcisms. And then Jesus goes to the cross as our king, wearing a crown of thorns. And he rises from the dead as our, as, as our king, renewing his creation. And now in the book of Acts, we see the kingdom advancing through the witness of the church. The Spirit empowers us to give witness to our King and to His kingdom. Or another way to say this is that the church is to be a signpost of the kingdom. You know, you know for example, you know, when you see a sign that says, you know, Disney World this way, 
You know, how silly would it be for, you know, us to stop the car, get the whole family out, take a picture next to the sign and said, yes, we made it. Now it's time to go home, right? No, it would be silly. The sign itself is not the destination. Instead, it is pointing to a greater reality. The church is a signpost to the kingdom of heaven, that it's within this community and how we interact and what we prioritize and value and talk about will give a glimpse to the watching world what the Lord has promised. Friends, is your life giving witness to our king and his kingdom? You know, there's an interesting exchange between Jesus and his disciples in verse 6. In verse 6, so when the disciples had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, notice the scope of their understanding of Christ's kingship. Jesus, when will you restore the Jewish kingdom? When will you restore the political kingdom? The disciples only understood Jesus' kingship and kingdom going as far as the borders of Israel. So this is why Jesus in verse 8 says to them that you're going to be my witnesses, not just here at home, but all the way to the ends of the earth. That he is making clear that when I ascend, I will not just be a king for the Jews, but I will be the king of all people everywhere. And thus, all of creation must know its king. The king who sacrificed for them, the king who bled for them, the king who cried and died for them, the king that was victorious for them. Our lives and our church are to give witness to this. And for the disciples, what happened here is that their eyes were on the wrong kingdom and it had to be corrected. That all their hope was placed in a political kingdom. And if I can just say, we have made the same mistakes that you don't have to look any further than this past election cycle to see that very often the church was no different than the world. It was divisive, driven by fear and hateful rhetoric, a complete lack of compassion, mercy, service, and love. Friends, are your eyes on the wrong kingdom? Because whatever kingdom holds your heart, you will give witness to it. For example... Will you be a witness of the materialism of the city or the radical generosity of the kingdom? Will you be a witness to the favoritism of the wealthy and influential? Or will you look out for the marginalized, oppressed, and poor? Will you be a witness to your mission to build your name? Or will you be a witness to the greatest name in all of history, Jesus Christ? Church, we need to remember this. We are all going to be witnesses. The only question is which kingdom will you give witness to? Which one will it be? So what's an application for us here? Let me just give you one. It's time to work the plan. It is time to work the plan. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in meetings where it's just like talking, talking, talking. It's like, oh, my goodness, you know, you know, strategizing. You know, let's get the whiteboard out. I'm like, oh, no more post notes. Like, let's stop, okay, right? It gets to the point where you're sitting in these meetings and you're just like, enough, okay, enough, okay? It's time to get to work. Can I just say that in the same way, when it comes to this gospel movement, the church people, we just love to talk. We love to preach the Great Commission. We love to strategize. We love the whiteboard. You know, we love to hear all these amazing stories of transformation. We love all these stories that are happening across the oceans over there. But so often, that's as far as we take it. We like to talk to each other about Jesus, but we don't talk to anybody outside these walls about Jesus. It's time to work the plan. You know, tonight, it's Super Bowl 55. That will be played in Tampa, those lucky people, okay? And the two quarterbacks will be playing will be Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes, and no doubt they were going to put on a show. Now, what's going to happen during the game is that these guys are going to get in a huddle with their teams. They're going to make the plan. They're going to talk about who's doing what, who's running which route. They'll get to the line of scrimmage, and they'll run the play, right? They're not going to go ahead and get to the line of scrimmage and just start gawking at each other, talking to one another, right? There's no time for that. The mission is to accomplish, they have a mission to accomplish, and that's to win the Super Bowl. In the same way for us as the church, our mission is clear. 
We don't have to guess what Jesus wants. He wants people to come to salvation. We don't have to guess where to go. It's to the ends of the earth, first starting here in Chicago. We don't have to guess who he wants to do it. He wants us, his church, to do it. We don't have to guess how he wants it done. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Church, there is not a whole lot to talk about here. The only question is this. Will we obey and work the plan? You know, let me just ask you the same question that I started with. What kind of church do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a church where you can just attend and receive spiritual services? Or do you want to be a church where it is a movement of the gospel changing the world? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, we thank you for King Jesus. We thank you that he is just beginning his work. That God, that he is calling people to salvation. And Father, that he has not left us empty-handed. He has not left us alone. But Father, that he has empowered his church with the Holy Spirit. Father, forgive us for so often in how we lean into ourselves we lean into our gifting, we lean into our talents, we lean into how much we know, we lean into our, 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 our skills. But Father, you call us to childlike faith. You call us to childlike dependence. So God, help us as a church to do that. That Father, before we start making all these plans and teams and ministries, God, help us to be a people who are praying. Help us to be a people who are waiting on your Holy Spirit. Because Father, we know that... It's in only through the Holy Spirit where we see change that will last for eternity. So God, help us, Lord, help us as a church, Lord. Help us to come to you. Lord, help us to be a movement of the gospel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.